Illumin. Men helping other men to become better, more authentic men. Please visit our website at Illumin.org. My name is Terry Simmons Booker, and I, as the uh, current president of Illumin, I welcome you to Solarize 2018. I want to continue the yes that we were saying outside with the uh, official Illumin welcome. And in this welcome, what we, it's a, a kind of a call and response. When I say, we say, we say, you respond, welcome. And you have it come with an open heart and from the gut. Feel your, your abdominal muscles push that welcome up, all the way up, the, up your spine. So let's practice one time. We say, welcome. To people on all parts of the continuum of gender identity and expression, especially men who are gay, bisexual, heterosexual, transgender, queer folks, the sexually active and the celibate, and for everyone for whom those labels do not apply, we say, Welcome. People of African descent, of Asian descent, of European descent, of First Nations descent in this land and abroad, and people of mixed and multiple descents, and all the languages spoken here, we say, Welcome. Your bodies, and bodies of all abilities and challenges, those living with a chronic medical condition, visible or invisible, we say, People who identify as activists and those who don't. Mystics, believers, seekers of all kinds, people of all ages, those who support you to be here, we say, Welcome. Your emotions, joy, fear, grief, contentment, disappointment, surprise, and all else that flows through you, we say, Welcome. Your families, genetic and otherwise, those dear to us who have died, our ancestors and the future ones, welcome to the ancestors who lived in this land, in this place where these buildings are now. We honor you through this work that we are undertaking. We say, welcome. We welcome brothers who feel broken, lost, struggling, who suffer from self-doubt and self-judgment. We say, welcome. All beings that inhabit this earth, human or otherwise, the two-legged, the four-legged, winged and finned, those that walk, fly, and crawl above the ground and below, in air and water, we say, Welcome. I would like to take a couple minutes to introduce a, a spiritual practice that um, we practice in a, an intentional community called Canical Farm that I'm a part of. We call it the Hineni practice. Hineni is a Hebrew word that means, here I am, I am ready. Literally, it means, here I am. Hineni is the answer to the question, literal, the, the literal question, Ayeha, Ayeha. And that means, where are you? One friend who is a rabbi has told me that what that question could be is something like this. It's, are you ready to take responsibility and be seen? Are you ready to take responsibility and be seen? And the answer is, Hanani, I am here, I am ready. 
It's a word that's used very rarely in the Hebrew scriptures. It comes up when the unspeakable, the unnameable, comes to Abram and says, Abram tells him to leave his home, leave the culture that raised him and that formed him, leave the land that's familiar to him and to go to a strange place, a place that would be named later that he wouldn't even see for quite a while. And he said, Hanani, here I am. When Moses was faced with the burning bush and was given in that soul encounter, that's when this shows up in the Hebrew scriptures and is when men are having their soul encounters. And the bush says, the unspeakable through the bush says, I have a task for you. I have your soul work for you to proclaim freedom, to lead people to freedom. Moses said, Hanani. When the unspeakable, the unnameable saw in Israel that there was a great unraveling happening, an unraveling of the economic systems, of the governmental systems, of the educational systems, of all the social systems, the unnameable asked, who's going to speak for the widows in this unraveling? Who's going to speak for the single mothers? Who's going to speak for the homeless? Who's going to speak for the immigrants? And Isaiah said, here I am, Hanani. Send me. Now the backdrop of those stories is the mythopoetic story out of Genesis 2, where on a night something like tonight, when Adam heard the Spirit of the Lord in the garden as a cool breeze and hid, God called out, Ayeka, where are you? And the answer from Adam was, I heard you in the garden, but I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid myself. I heard you in the garden, but I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid myself. And God said, who told you you were naked? Who told you you were naked? And I, brothers, I don't believe this is about sinning or about moral feelings or anything like that. This is about shame and shaming. And so I ask, brothers, who told you you were naked? Who told you you were weak? Who told you you weren't good enough? Who told you that you were a crybaby? Who told you you were a faggot? Who told you you were a queer? Who told you you weren't man enough? Who told you that there wasn't a place for you in the council of men? So this is the practice, brothers, to pay attention to those voices. Don't deny them. Don't, don't, don't shove them away. Pay attention. Just know that they're there. Pay attention to those voices. And don't allow them to keep you from showing up, Hanani. If you need help doing that, ask for it. That's the practice, too. If you see brothers around you, who need help and support in showing up because of those voices, give the help. And if I am doing or if you are doing anything in any way that you talk or any way that you act that discourages other brothers from showing up in their true self, pay attention to that. So that's the practice. So if you're willing to commit to that practice over these next few days, I'm going to ask you to stand up and I'm going to ask you, and you answer, Hanani, okay? Go ahead and stand up, please. Because I want to hear it from those of you. I'm inviting you from the very bottom of your abdomen, the, the, the bottom of your gut, right down here in the hara. That if you're, if you're ready, say Hanani. Here I am. I'm ready. Ayeha. Hanani. Ayeha. Hanani. Ayeha. Hanani. Thank you, brothers. I'm going to have one of the aluminum weavers, Joel Blunk, is going to come up and transition us to the next portion of the evening. Thank you, Joel. Thank you, Terry. Hanani, here I am. And I am so glad that I am here with you, brothers. Welcome to Tamiya and welcome to Solarize. 
I was asked if I would uh, step in in this moment to greet you as well on behalf of our wisdom elders, our weavers, our conveners, our ritual elders, our board, all who helped to make uh, this event possible and greet you, whether this is your first time or whether this is your 15th Illumin event, welcome. We are glad you're here and we're glad you've come. We wanted to let you know, especially those who are back for a second or third or fourth time, that this solar rise is going to be a little different than other solar rises. And the reason is because we want to go a little deeper. We are going to drum, we're going to do ritual, we're going to spend time in wild places, we're going to practice the way of counsel, we're going to stand shoulder to shoulder with one another and tell stories. That's what we do. That's what we do when we come together. But we're also going to step in a little deeper and we're going to do some soul work together. And to do that, we need a guide. We need someone to show us the way. We need someone who has been there before us. We can only lead as far as we have gone ourselves. We all know that. And I can think of no one who can take us deeper, better than Bill Plotkin. I had the good fortune in 2009 uh, to participate in a soul craft intensive among the sequoias in Northern California. It was an amazing experience. I brought my journal with me and I read that on the opening night of that event, I went to my room and I wrote something like this. This is crazy. <laughs> and I said, I am going to do soul work and I don't even know what that is. But I believe that I need to do it. And I believe that I have something to discover about myself that will only happen if I have the courage to step in a little deeper to my life. That evening, we had danced. We had drawn with colors. We had done some deep imaging, and I wrote in my journal, it was really strange. It was a new language. It was a new experience. And I also told myself, trust this. It's right, and you need this, Joel. And so the next day, I got up, having dreamed a dream, and I stepped out, and I did it again. And like the men's rites of passage that many of us have had an experience of, that experience and later a vision quest with Anima changed my life. And I'm here today, I'm standing up in front of you because of the courage that that experience provided me. My loyal soldier voices, which you're going to hear sometime this week, used to scream, Joel, you can't get up in front of 300 men and say anything. And I believed them. But they have been recommissioned. And they serve me now. And together we stand before you, excited about this possibility that we have to do this work together, to go deeper, to walk out onto the sea and see what happens, what might happen to each of us. Antonio Machado said that mankind has four things that don't work at sea. An anchor, rudder, oars, and the fear of going down. Brothers, you have courage too the courage that it will take for you to go down and to do some deep work. So I invite you to trust our weaver these next few days and to try it 
and to trust that a cottonwood might have something to say to you that you need to hear. Or that by dancing, you might discover a latent energy, a fire inside you that needs to come out. When you tell yourself or you hear that voice that says, this is silly, I want you to say, say to yourself, okay, I'm going to do it anyways. I'm going to try. I'm going to show up. Hanini, I am here now in this. And I'm going to give myself to the next few days and trust that we're all in it together and that we're going some way. We are wandering together. We each have our own work to do, but brothers, we are in it together with one another. So trust it and take a step and allow yourself to do the deep work. This is an opportunity. You signed up for this, right? <laughs> we agreed to come. You got the preparation packet. You read it through. That's something that we've never done for Solarize before. That should have given you some indication that we're serious and that we have some important, important work to do. It'll also be fun. And you are liable to discover some things that will turn your life around and will grow us all up. This world needs us to grow up and to be true elders and to give the gifts that we have to give away. So practice a little self-care this weekend. Do this for you, but know that as you care for yourself, you're caring for the world. And that this is just the beginning, that the wandering we have to do is out beyond these walls, beyond this place, back in our own neighborhoods and communities. Serve yourself so that you can serve others. Be present, arrive. Stay together in this. Bill Plotkin describes himself as a psychologist gone wild. A psychologist gone wild. A cultural visionary, author, and wilderness guide, he has been blazing new trails for decades. His echocentric revisioning of psychology invites us into a conscious and embodied relationship with soul and with the natural world. Now, in mythopoetic terms, he is the cocoon weaver. He is cocoon weaver. His method is to create sacred space in which people, in which you and I, can again, can learn again from wild nature as it exists both inside of ourselves and outside of us all around. In so doing, he helps people discover their essential nature. The truth at the center of the image you were born with is how the poets say it. He will help us find the truth at the center of the image each of us were born with. That will happen as we are invited to enter into the turbulent waters of soul. Remember, there are four things that don't work at sea. But you have what you need to step into those turbulent waters where we will find our lives transformed. You know about his books, I hope, Soul Craft and... Uh, Wild Mind and Nature and the Human Soul, those will be available. But I want you to join me in welcoming him here in the person with us tonight and throughout this weekend. He is our soul guide, the cocoon weaver. Will you welcome him with me as he invites us to find that place where our deep gladness and the world's deep hunger meet. Cocoon Weaver, Hope. Thank you, 
<clears throat> Thank you, Joel. Um, this is interesting. <laughs> and um, <clears throat> it's kind of interesting, isn't it, to be invited to do something crazy, which um, I think I, I did hear Joel say that. And it's true. It really is crazy in some ways that we'll be talking about. Um, I want to thank the, the Illumin board and program team uh, for inviting me. This is a risky thing for them, I'm guessing. It's somewhat risky. And um, it's risky for me. I've been doing this kind of work for almost 40 years, and we generally work with small groups, 12 or 16, because it's very individualized. But the Illumin people have found a way to do this to make it somewhat customized for each one of you. Anyways, with the 30 council or clan circles, and um, I have 10 of my Animus colleagues here who will be working with you in breakout groups, and they'll be visiting your council circles to stir up some trouble <laughs> with you. Um, so it's, it's not my typical setting in working with people. It's usually very one-on-one, -on -one, um, very I-thou. So it's kind of risky for me. But let's get to the more important risk. This might be really risky for you. If with any luck at all, this is going to be risky for you. And we're going to, my colleagues and I are intending to uh, stir up the best we can some good kind of trouble. Um, and the, the trouble has to do with the, the journey um, to mystery, into mystery, into the unknown, the journey into terrain, natural terrain and spiritual terrain and psychological terrain that is unfamiliar to you. That's what we're going to be inviting you to do. It's up to you uh, if you go and how far you go. So it's a journey into mystery. It's also a journey into wholeness. Now, Wholeness sounds like, okay, that's a pretty good thing. That's safe enough. But the kind of wholeness that I'll be inviting you into is actually quite risky. It's the kind, it's the, the whole realm of wholeness that contemporary, the contemporary world, Western culture, most contemporary cultures, most religions, most spiritualities actually try to keep us safe from. And um, this weekend will be a kind of taster of um, those realms. Uh, some tasting in terms of um, some talks that I'll do, um, but mostly in terms of experiences and practices on the land that we invite you to engage in. Um, When I say it's a taste, I don't mean it's shallow. It means um, that we're going to offer you some maps of wholeness and an introduction to those maps and also an introduction to some of the kinds of practices we use. Uh, typically, our introductory programs are five days long and as I say, 12, maybe up to 30 people. But even though this will be a taster, it's quite possible. Don't feel too safe when I say it's a, a taster because things can actually go very, very deep even uh, in three days. So here's a poem. I'll be using a lot of poetry. And this first one is written by my partner, my life partner, Janine Marie Haugen. And it's called Trail Sign. Trail Sign which is a relevant theme for uh, a journey into unknown terrain. And one of the themes in this poem perhaps is uh, imagination, that we're gonna really need our imagination to um, get very far down the trail. And in the contemporary world, especially the Western world, the imagination has been dissed in a way. We tend to contrast you know, reality and then imagination. Uh, true 
and an another synonym for false is imagination. But in fact, I'm quite certain that our imagination, especially our deep imagination, the images uh, and the input that we get from the depths that we are not in control of, the images that come unbidden, like our dreams, for example, um, help us discover what is real. In fact, I, I'm, one of the things I've been uh, most become most certain of in, in decades of doing this work is that we can't discover anything that is real without our deep imagination. Uh, oh, a poem, that's where I was going. Um, oh, I wanted to tell you, I'll get to the poem, but um, when we were out um, uh, outside together just before we came in, um, I was just looking with soft vision of this group drumming, and one thing I got was struck by was the name tags. The, one of the things that was easiest to see because they're white were these name tags, and it was this, all these people with name tags, and my deep imagination whispered, they're targets. <laughs> like, mystery has a certain kind of magical bow and arrow and knows exactly where to shoot, and most of those targets are right over the hearts. Okay, there's an example. Trail sign, that was an example of imagination. Unbidden, trail sign. Je oh, this is advice, some information, and some cautions on the journey that I'll be encouraging you to take a first step on this weekend, or maybe you've been on this journey for quite a long time, and just your next steps. Trail sign. Just around the bend, past the bog if you're not sucked in, turn into the darkest tangle. Keep going. Again, I want to say I, I picked this poem out because there's great advice for you this weekend. Just around the bend, past the bog if you're not sucked in, turn in to the darkest tangle. Keep going. But beware, if you're seeking safety, turn around. You've come the wrong way. If you dare this crooked path, prepare for landslides, lightning, ravenous beasts, sneaker waves, raven disguised as people, people disguised as raven, soul weavers, dream listeners, Ceremonies from the holy earth, stars landing in your cupped hands, and the most amazing views. When the trail disappears, as it does, often, remember our teacher who said, you make the trail by walking. When the trail disappears, as it does, often, Remember our teacher who said, you make the trail by walking. Beyond this sign, your customary currency has no value. Here, no one wants it. Are you sure this is the way? You can still turn back. Farther down this tangled trail, love will crack the guardhouse of your heart until you wail with earth's pain. Or weep with the ecstasy of angels. In the least presence, you will find unspeakable cosmic glory. In the night sky, you will recognize ancestors. The dead will come in dreams. The living are everywhere. Wearing the faces of clouds, water, cottonwood, granite. If you want searing aliveness, there is no safe route. There is no safety. 
You don't believe it? See for yourself. Just around the bend, past the bog if you're not sucked in, turn into the darkest tangle. Follow the barely heard call. Sometimes it will seem the singer is beside you. Sometimes it will seem the singer is beside you or ahead or behind or inside. Keep going. Okay, three questions. These are rhetorical questions. Where are we? Who are we? Where are we going? Okay, here's some answers. Where are we here now? We usually answer that kind of question in kind of human, in terms of human created places. Like, an address, or a city, or a conference center, or a business, or a store. And now that we have cell phones, when people call us, they ask, where are you? And we say, well, I'm shopping at such and such a place. But an essential part of the answer always to where are we is where are we in the larger Earth community? So the answer I have in mind does not meaningfully include words and phrases of fictional places like New Mexico, the United States. These are fictional places that we agree are real because we treat them as if they're real. But the real places are the places that are real before we even existed. And they are places that are real independent of us. Places like, and we give our own word names to real places, like the Rio Grande River, the Cottonwood Bosque, the Cottonwood Forest, North America, the Sandia Mountains, the high southwest desert, Earth, Milky Way. So I wanted to guide you in a short meditation to help us arrive here. This is the first question, where are we? And you can have your eyes open or closed or some of each. Here we are in our bodies. That's another real thing, our bodies. With our eyes open or closed at Tamaya, also known as the Santa Ana Pueblo, in the high desert of the American Southwest, on the banks of the Rio Grande, the Great River, flowing toward us down from the San Juan Mountains to our north, and past us toward the Gulf of Mexico in the south. Here we are. Here we sit beneath the Sandia Mountains to our east, and the Santa Ana Canyons and mesas to our west, here in this particular room, sitting in these chairs at this year's Solar Rise, in a large group of men, but also with our enlivening awareness of the greater world around us, and experiencing through our mammalian senses a felt connection to the wild world outside these walls, the world now in its colorful fall wardrobe, the lowering angle of the sun, the river running cooler, the chamisa, a rabbit brush, gone to seed in bouquets of yellow, the cottonwood shedding their leaves, and the geese, coyote, eagle, deer, and pronghorn all around us, as well as raven, porcupine, badger, bear, mountain lion, and our many other animal relatives, and the waxing moon rising now in the east sky, all this at a particular location and bioregion we call the Rio Grande Valley, where the Tamaya Pueblo people have lived for many hundreds of years. 
on the North American continent, on planet Earth, our sacred home, a four and a half billion year old celestial body, the third planet from the star we call the sun in a galaxy we call the Milky Way in an astounding 14 billion year old, constantly evolving, vastly intelligent, wildly imaginative, and living creation we call the universe. I offer my unspeakable gratitude to all the beings we are and all those that surround us and among whom we live and all the places and all our relationships with each other and with each thing and place, each alive, each breathing and speaking in its own way. May we offer ourselves in loving service to this world so precious and so endangered by our own species in this time, and now in such need of our engaged participation and contributions. Wait. Okay, so where we are. And a second question is, who are we? Who are we here now? That's always a good question. It relates to another question, who can we become? So consider this, that who we are has a lot to do with who we can become, that we each have a certain potential to serve this world, to gift this world, and that's who we are right now. The, a person, a man who has the potential to become something. And here's this third part of it, third part, because I said, who are we now? Well, it has something to do with who we can become, but check this out. What if who we can become is the being we were born as? And our true potential is to become the person we were born as, that, that the cosmos, the earth, gave birth to us in order to become something that was already decided and written in a certain sense who we were when we were born or before we were born. And that's who we are now is the person who was born to be someone that we're not fully yet. So um, during this weekend, uh, my 10 Animus colleagues and I are going to be inviting you to discover some things about who you were born as. And there's two aspects to who each of us, or you could say everything on the planet, there's two aspects to what everything is born as. Every, and it applies to us humans and us men. One aspect is, or one whole domain is that there are certain things we all share. We're all born to embody certain capacities or resources. And, and we all have our own slightly different versions of those same things. So in other words, there's a collective aspect to who we were born as, as humans. And here's the bad news, that my reading is, I'm not the only one, is that contemporary society, contemporary cultures do not support us to cultivate any of those dimensions of wholeness that we were born with. Because we're born with them, but the question is whether we cultivate them or not. And the second um, aspect of what we, who we were born as is absolutely, totally unique to us individually. And that's what I refer to as the soul. So um, fair warning, if you haven't uh, read my books and committed them to memory yet, the odds are very strong that I am using the word soul very differently than you do and that your psychological and uh, religious and spiritual traditions. Um, but I'm going to save that for a day or two before I talk too much about soul. Okay, so together, these, these resources, these facets of wholeness that we're born with and as, 
I call our original human wholeness, OHW, our original human wholeness. And that's really what I want, the journey I want to invite you on, the journey to wholeness, to our original human wholeness, both the collective and the absolutely unique to you aspects. Okay, third question, where are we going this weekend? Well, okay, I've already said it's a journey to wholeness. And I wanna ask you here to help me open up a space within you from which you can approach the possibilities of wholeness in a way you might never have before. Like if you could imagine opening up a space inside of you where you're saying, okay, I'm willing to go on this journey. And here's the first distinction that might surprise you or even disturb you. I wonder how many of you are familiar with this idea. That cultivating wholeness does not have anything particularly to do with healing or the recovery from problems or difficulties or misfortunes. Because that's often the way we think of wholeness. It's um, what I achieve if I recover from the various kinds of problems, syndromes, illnesses, um, self-doubt, addictions, trauma. And so this may be, is this a stretch for some of you that, that wholeness, the way I use the term, is something very different from healing. And I'm going to be inviting you into um, to, uh, exploring these realms of wholeness. So the, the cultivation of our original human wholeness, we might say, is a paradigm or an approach to human development that is very distinctive from what we have in the contemporary Western world in medicine, in religion, in spirituality, um, in addiction recovery programs, in psychotherapies, and community mental health perspectives, which is all about healing. And there's all kinds of reasons for that. I won't go into them right now, if at all, this weekend. But I'm inviting you to break into a, a very different worldview where there's something that's even more important than healing, and that is cultivating our original human wholeness. And what I've come to believe and discovered in the work, work I do with people is that much of the woundedness that we carry as human beings does not come so much from having been wounded, but comes from deficits in our original human wholeness that so many of the syndromes and the symptoms and the wounds and the problems and the addictions and the trauma we have are a result of having grown up, having been raised in uh, societies and cultures that neglect or often actually suppress the facets of our original human wholeness. But wait a minute, you might say to yourself, what's wrong with healing? Absolutely nothing. Healing is absolutely essential. It's when it, and that when we're wounded, healing is very, very important. The problem is what it leaves out. That when we uh, fix our problems or address our deficits, we kind of go from a negative to a zero. And, you know, we, we often use, you hear people using the phrase, like if they feel they've been hurt or damaged in some way, they'll say, I want to be made whole again, right? You, or you need to make me whole again. And what they mean, don't they? Isn't it true that what we mean when we say that is that I want you to fix the problem you created for me. I want to get back to where I was before. Okay, that's healing, which is a really good thing. But it's not the same as holing. Holing is going from either negatives or from zero to an unlimited uh, amounts of positive, moving towards our innate uh, birthright of human magnificence and genius and our own destiny. That is more than healing. 
Maybe I've said that too many times already. You got the uh, picture here. Okay. Oh. The reason we haven't questioned our cultural focus or obsession with healing, nothing wrong with healing, is because healing is so clearly a good and essential goal. Why would you possibly question it? Again, the problem is what it leaves out. Okay, so here's another poem. <clears throat> this is one maybe a lot of you know. It's um, Mary Oliver's The Journey. How many people know The Journey? How many people would say you know it pretty well? How many people have memorized it? Anybody? Kind of? Okay. So this is a poem I've been working with for... 20 years, something like that. And one quality for me of a really good poem is that I just keep learning from it. And this past week, I've um, been learning some new things from this poem. Um, so, and maybe you'll catch some things too. And for those of you who know Mary Oliver's poetry, I wonder if you would agree with me that this is a really unusual Mary Oliver poem. Like what she's known for is her her brilliant, deeply descriptive, almost innocent descriptions of the wild world, the wild, what we might call the natural world. And there's almost nothing in nature in this entire poem. There's a cameo appearance of rocks and branches, clouds, stars, and the wind makes an appearance. But it's not like any of her other poems. And um, I think this came from a different place in her and uh, which makes it uh, very special for me. Um, and one thing we get with this poem is that she really knows what she's talking about. She's talking about embarking upon a journey into the unknown, into mystery. And the poem, again, is entitled The Journey. Here it is. One day, you finally knew what you had to do and began. That's two things. One day, you finally knew. I'm going to recite this twice, by the way. And, and the second time, I'm going to interrupt myself even more than the first time. Because <laughs> I want to point out some things that she's doing here. One day, you finally knew what you had to do and began, though the voices around you kept shouting their bad advice. Though the whole house began to tremble and you felt that old tug at your ankles. Mend my life, each voice cried. But you didn't stop. You knew what you had to do, though the wind pried with its stiff fingers at the very foundations, though their melancholy, mend my life, though their melancholy was terrible. It was already late enough, and a wild night, and the road full of fallen branches and stones. But little by little, as you left their voices behind, mend my life, as you left their voices behind, the stars began to burn through the sheets of clouds, and there was a new voice, which you slowly recognized as your own, that kept you company as you strode deeper and deeper into the world, determined to do the only thing you could do, determined to save the only life you could save. <clears throat> That's the kind of journey my colleagues and I are inviting you on. So here it is the second time, somewhat annotated. One day, you finally knew what you had to do and began. How, how many of you have had a day like that? You finally knew what you had to do. OK, now make it more difficult. And began. <laughs> Great. Me too. Though the voices around you kept shouting their bad advice. OK, I'm going to help Mary here a little bit. These are voices around us. like. People we live with, family, colleagues, teachers, religious leaders, and so on. 
But these are also voices inside of us too, okay? I'm sure she meant that. One day you finally knew what you had to do and began, though the voices around you and inside of you kept shouting their bad advice. What was the advice? Mend my life. What about me? Take care of me. What about my problem? That you, need, you owe me this. I need you to do this. And I, one of the things I learned about this poem after 20 years this week was um, that phrase, mend my life. She's talking about healing. It's a kind of healing. The voices say, mend me, heal me. But you didn't stop. You knew what you had to do. Um, though the whole house began to tremble. Okay, and this, we can take this as the house of your belonging, the house of your identity, uh, the story that, that you've been living. One day you finally knew what you had to do and began, though the voices around you kept shouting their bad advice, though the whole house began to tremble, and you felt that old tug at your ankles keeping you from leaving home, the home of your identity, and they're saying, mend my life. And you say, yeah, right, got it, can't go, sorry, maybe some other time. But on this day you didn't stop, you knew what you had to do, though the wind pried with its stiff fingers at the very foundations. Okay, there she's really rubbing it in. She's saying, okay, the foundations of your whole life are at risk here. <clears throat> it was already late enough and a wild night. Right, that's when it happens. That's when we finally go on the journey. When we got into a place, we've hung out there too long in a certain sense. And, and, and uh, it's, it's like, it's almost our last chance sometimes. It's already late enough and a wild night. It's not during a calm, wonderfully calm moment in your life. And the road full of fallen branches and stones, but little by little as you left their voices behind, the ones who say, don't leave, you gotta take care of me, you gotta fix this problem. Um, and that's how we are socialized as men, right? That we're the fixers. But you didn't stop. And as you made your way down that road, the, st the stars began to burn through the sheets of clouds. And there was a new voice, which you slowly recognized as your own. Now that's an amazing moment in life. When we hear that voice, sometimes we literally hear the voice, even though it's coming inside, from inside. And we realize, that's my voice. That's my true voice. And it kept you company. There's a, there's a real kind of sweetness in that, uh, nurturance, that there's this part of us that will keep us company and will take us by the hand. It's the inner wanderer, you might say, or the guide to soul, who takes us by the hand and says, okay, we're gonna stride deeper and deeper into the world, determined to do the only thing you could do at this point in your life, determined to, do, to save the only life you can save. And that life, which is the only one you can save, I believe, is the life you were born to inhabit. Each of us being born uh, to do a certain thing in life, which has everything to do with what I mean by soul. But I'll say more about it uh, in a day or two. Soul has something to do with our destiny and the life we were born to take and the person we were born to be. So it's a, um, the day I knew what I had to do kind of moment. So um, I've had a few of those in my life. Here's the biggest one. Um, when I was 28 years old, I was a um, psychology professor in upstate New York at State University of New York at Albany, SUNY Albany. So it was my second year, and I was doing, um, I was mostly, it's a, mostly a research position, I was also teaching. My classes were really popular, and my research was really interesting to, to me, and I was publishing in the best journals, and my research was about non-ordinary states of consciousness, which is why I went to grad school. 
I wanted to study consciousness. I wanted to learn more about the shifts in consciousness that really change people's lives in a big way and uh, that allow us to actually experience the world in a different way. And I had been um, training for something like 10 years to get to this position. Uh, and I had graduate students doing my research studies for me. Uh, it, was, it, was, it was like my dream come true. And um, that winter, it was in January, um, it had just snowed. It was really a big snow in the uh, Adirondack Mountains. And um, being a wilderness-oriented person, I thought I would go for a um, mountain climb and couldn't find any friends who were up for it, so I just grabbed my snowshoes and my um, hiking poles and um, took off up to a mountain called Cascade Peak. Anybody know Cascade Peak? You do? Yeah. And uh, it was a beautiful sunny day after maybe three feet of fresh snow the night before. And, uh, and the trees, the conifers were snow laden. And if I brushed them a little bit with my shoulder, you'd get that, that musical uh, shower of uh, snow, powder snow. Um, and I was really enjoying it. It was a good time. I felt so solid in myself and my story. And I got to the top. Um, and uh, it's not above tree line. I don't think there was any mountains in the Adirondacks above tree line, but it has a bald top, which is one of the reasons it's a great peak to climb. And I was able to look out over the entire valley. Um, it's completely snow covered in the mountains in all directions. It was absolutely stunning, beautiful. I felt like a really, really lucky human to be there. And I was probably only there for a minute or two when uh, this immense ball of feeling came up from my gut and up through my chest and through my heart and into my throat. And um, I, I had no idea where it was coming from. And it was uh, a combination of immense grief and immense hope, and simultaneously mixed up, grief and hope. Um, I see some people shaking heads. Have you experienced that combo of really huge grief and hope? Like either one of them, you couldn't possibly survive, and, but they're both together. Um, and um, um, I fell to my knees and uh, just, just this wail came, came out of me. And uh, I knew in that moment that the life I had been living was completely over. That um, I wasn't actually meant to spend my life in the ivory tower as a researcher. And, um, and the grief was the loss of everything I had achieved in my life. And the hope was for something like discovering who I really was, that I knew who I had been was not who I was, and I knew that I didn't know anything about what I was actually for. And um, I turned around and I hiked down that mountain knowing that when I got back to town, I would resign my, my position. Oh, that's what I almost forgot. When I was still on the summit, I looked way out into the distance, and there was a river. It's a river valley, so there was a river out there, and the sun was gleaming off uh, some corner of the river. And, and what my muse said to me in that moment was that thing, that you have to go out into the world and find what that thing is, because it has the answer. It's out there somewhere in that gleam at the bend of that river. <clears throat> so I went down the mountain knowing that I, was, I would resign my university position and I was going to go out into the world and find that gleaming thing. So I want to invite you now for a few minutes, um, like five minutes, if you have your journal with you, hope you brought it with you, 
Um, I'm going to give you six questions. And they're short questions. And maybe you'll write them down because maybe you'll return to some of these questions during the weekend. But I'd like you to also, whichever question grabs you the strongest right now, I want to invite you to start uh, almost like uh, intuitive thinking, just writing down some quick answers without trying to make it make too much sense. So again, I'm going to give you some questions, but I'm also inviting you in these next five minutes to actually start writing an answer to at least one of the questions. First one is, do you know what you have to do now in your life? If so, what? Like Mary Oliver, one day you finally knew what you had to do and began. Do you know what you have to do now in your life? If so, what? I'm just going to give you all six questions. Are you hearing any bad advice from the voices around you and within you at this time in your life? If so, what's the bad advice? Are you hearing any bad advice from the voices around you or within you? If so, what's the bad advice you're getting? Third question, what in your life is ending now, if anything? What in your life is ending now? And the fourth is, what is being born, if anything? And you can take that to me in the fourth one. Also, where are you headed? What is being born in your life at this time? Or where are you headed? The fifth one is, sorry? Wait. I'm not expecting you to answer these until I just try to write them down. Okay, thank you. Yeah, good feedback, thanks. Ready? Okay. What is your deepest longing? And the last... Sixth question, what is calling you? What is calling you or calling to you, even if you're ignoring it, maybe especially if you're ignoring it? It could be just some examples to, so you have a sense of what I'm asking here. It could be a wild desire of some sort that's calling to you. Some kind of opportunity, maybe a spiritual opportunity. Or it could be a symbol maybe from your dreams or a symbol that you're, that's showing up in your life in some way. Or it could be... Sorry? The question number five? That was, what is your deepest longing? Okay. And the sixth one, again, is what's calling you? A wild desire, an opportunity, a symbol, an archetype a myth or a story or a way of being in service. Okay, and now I, I want to give you four or five minutes and just write, like intuitively, whatever comes as an answer to any of those questions. Okay, here's um, a last poem for the evening. It's Antonio Machado. Uh, translated by Robert Bly. You walking, your footprints are the road and nothing else. You walking, your footprints are the road and nothing else. There is no road walker. You make the road by walking. By walking, you make the road. And when you look backward, you see the path that you never will step on again. Walker, there is no road. 
only wind trails in the sea. Walker, there is no road, only wind trails in the sea.